portfolio. <laughs> okay. Very good. So uh, we continue the discussion of uh, yesterday, and uh, we were uh, uh, talking about the the erosion with uh, uh, oxygen or hydrogen of the mixture to see how the performance can can change because of this possible contribution. And we, in particular, we have seen we have this kind of the expressions. So actually, the subject is the role of molar mass of the species and how they affect the, the overall performance. So we see that if we uh, dilute with... Uh, Grazie mille. Una prova sempre per vedere se siete attenti oppure meno. Queste sono le prove più importanti. Adesso lo vedete lo schermo? Ora sì, grazie. Perfetto, grazie ancora. Mi sento meno solo. So now we can... Uh, Right, what we, we saw yesterday. This kind of dilution with uh, hydrogen or with oxygen of the basic reaction in stoichiometric proportion of hydrogen and oxygen. So we we consider this kind of reaction, and then we say also say that this H2O means the equilibrium condition at that temperature with, uh, uh, is not exactly H2O, there will be some dissociated species, but uh, for the, our uh, evaluation, we call this at this moment H2O, and we have seen how that this does not affect uh, the uh, molar fraction, uh, sorry, the mass fractions, that you have expressed in this way for the products. I put a P here to record that this is the uh, mass fraction of hydrogen within the products. If we dilute with hydrogen and if we dilute with oxygen, we have this expression. 16m divided by 16m plus 9. Then, so we are uh, considering this dilution to see what happens if we decrease the maximum temperature while adding one of the two uh, ingredients, let's say the reactants. And we have seen that if we like to top with the same temperature to perhaps to not go at such high temperature that lead to dissociation. So we like to reduce this temperature. And if we fix a given value of Tc, we, have, we found that we can expect that it will be n equal to n. This is what we found at the end of class uh, yesterday. So, uh, of course, we have also to consider, our, our goal is to see uh, what is the, the, the exit velocity that we can realize. And in this case, we have that in the first case, it would have square root of minus two. This is something we have already written. And I recall that this, term in square brackets is uh, referring to the, the equilibrium composition and the, the, the corresponding uh, entropies, absolute entropies that we have for the uh, remaining part, this one that we call it to. 
And this term is the same because we are at the same temperature. So the remaining part has the same relative amount, which only depends on the temperature, even if we dilute with, uh, we dilute with uh, oxygen. So in this way, we can, uh, of course, express one minus y, one minus y here, based on uh, this result. And uh, as a consequence, also make the ratio of these two quantities to see what happens at the same temperature if I dilute with hydrogen or oxygen. So one minus YH2 will be nine over N plus nine, and one minus YO2 will be nine over 16 M plus nine. We can simplify the number nine, which appears on both numerator and, de and denominator, and this becomes 16 m plus 9 over n plus 9, right? If we assume that, as we said before, that we are considering the same temperature so that m is about the same as n, and so we can say that this is the expression that can be, it's just a function of n equal to m. And uh, if n is equal to zero, m equal to zero means that we have no dilution. And so of course we have the same result independently of uh, if, you are, if you are not diluting with oxygen or, or hydrogen. And so uh, this is one. And we see that, uh, of course, if n goes to infinity, it becomes 16. That means we have this an increasing function up to this value of 4. So we see that the lower the temperature we aim to, re to reach, the higher will be, the more convenient will be to dilute with the lighter species. What uh, is important here is that the, the, the one that gives us the best performance for a given temperature is the lightest one. But this is something that we know. It's something that we know because we found it also considering our, uh, this is consistent with the fact that C star is a, a square root of uh, Tc over M1 over capital gamma. So you see that except for the role of gamma, here we see that C star should be proportional to the square root of temperature over the molar mass. And so we can expect that if we fix the temperature, the only player besides gamma is the molar mass. And we can compare, we can get the same result looking to the value of M. So what is the value of the molar mass in case we are diluting, diluting with hydrogen? Uh, we recall that one over the molar mass is the sum of Ys over M, and so it will be Y H2 over M H2 plus 1 minus Y H2 over the molar mass of products that can be 
H2O or that combination at equilibrium at the temperature. And so we see here that this will be uh, n over n plus 9. And this m is equal to 2. So I have to put 2 here. And uh, for the other term, we have 9 is 1 minus yh2 is 9 over n plus 9. And here that multiplies this mp. So we can uh, group this and say that we have uh, 2 plus n plus 9 at denominator. And this will be n plus 18 over mp. We can make the same uh, evaluation for the dilution with oxygen. And I have to change screen. Which is not so convenient in this case, but this is 1 over m for the second mixture. It's y O2 m O2 plus 1 minus y O2 mp. This m is the same that we have seen before because we are at the same temperature and we have the same uh, relative amount and so the same molar mass of the products. And uh, here we have, uh, that will be 16m over 16m plus 9. This is YO2. And then we have MO2, which is 32. And on the other side, we have here is 9 over 16M plus 9. That multiplies, this is 1 minus YO2, and there will be MP here. So I can group also in this case. Uh, we say here we see, we can simplify. And we have uh, twice 16m plus 9. Uh, and this is the denominator on this side. And we have m plus, again, to make this 2 appear, that would be 18 over mp. So if I consider on the basis of, if we assume for convenience at this moment, so it's not, this is a wrong assumption that we have the same gamma. Let's assume that we have the same gamma. And uh, U E M over U E N is not necessarily true. N over M as before, and this will be square root of Tc over m n square root Tc over m n. So simplify Tc, we have uh, both one over the molar masses in both cases, and so we can. Uh, make this substitution. Here we have that everything is under square root and the one over M or dilution with oxygen will be M plus 18 over MP over 2 16 M plus 9. And what we have got before was this value here that you see, and this n 
plus 18 over mp divided by 2 n plus 9. Okay, so that if we consider now n equal to m, we can simplify these two terms and of course the number two, and we are back to the former expression, which is 16 n plus 9 over n plus 9. So you see that these results are consistent with each other. So let's now see, uh, make some further steps. We, are, we, are, we see that we have some differences coming from the different value of the mixture ratio. And uh, we have seen that for the same temperature, we can have different performance depending on, let's say, the initial composition of reactants. So it could be interesting to see the performance for varying this mixture ratio. So what we, do, we should expect is that maximum performance is when we have stoichiometric conditions. And in some sense it can be, but we have to be careful. So we have to recall that what matters is that it's our, as a reference, is our uh, eta of reaction. And let's consider this as the uh, value that we have in chamber at this moment. So we assume we are in the idea of frozen expansion. So let's assume here this is the sum of yi at chamber delta h f i zero. And we consider also reactants as standard conditions. So actually what happens is that if we look to the behavior of this quantity, we find it's a function of OF. We find something like this. When we look to, this is for uh, hydrogen oxygen, we assume chamber pressure of 100 bar. So you make the value, we've seen 7.9, let's call it eight for convenience at this moment. And we see that we have a peak that should be something like four or something less, which is half the mixture ratio uh, that we have at stoichiometric condition. So this is something related to what we have seen before. Uh, and the reason is that we should see here we have different terms. Hmm? We have y and we have delta h. And there is, of course, what will, what will be the point where we have this maximum heat release will be the point, the conditions, if possible, where we have the maximum y for H2O, which is the only, uh, let's say, exothermic product that we have in the reaction. So, of course, you have to balance here because if you have, in principle, if you have the maximum will be when this Y I see, let's say, is just the value of H2O is one. So this gives us the maximum. 
But we know that if we are a stoichiometric proportion, we have that this is not true because we have other byproducts that are obtained by endothermic reactions. So it means that you have to add something. You will have that this Y is not one for H2O. And you will have some YOH, YO, YH. And all of them have positive entropy of formation. So you see that this will be reduced with respect to, let's say, an ideal value that could be this one. This is for y H2O equal to 1. Uh, so we can imagine we can force at least uh, at numerical, uh, by numerical computation, we can force that the only product is H2O. And so, uh, of course, if in this case on the left, we have only H2 and H2O, and on the right, you have just O2 and H2O. So we consider a complete reaction where we have no equilibrium, we have just a H2O as the product. And in this case, what we would have is a line like this. So actually this line will also approach better this, this other one. Oh. The line will join as we move uh, towards higher values of oil. So you see that we have a separation of the two lines here. And uh, actually, in this case, of course, by, by construction, we have that the maximum will be y1 when we have the stoichiometric proportion where, of course, we have some dilution in the other cases. That means that you have not y equal to 1. This formation here is 0. It's just a reduction of this value that are obvious. So can we realize this? Actually, we can say that this is something that occurs if we consider very high chamber pressure. This means that if you consider intermediate conditions, you have something in between. So we cannot say in general that the maximum and uh, these lines are obtained considering equilibrium condition with the formation of all the possible species. So you see that we cannot say the best condition is at a given mixture ratio. The maximum it's released, the maximum exploitable energy is at a given mixture ratio. The answer is that it depends on pressure. And we will go also in more detail about this, but in general we have seen that by the, the equilibrium conditions, if we have something like dissociation reactions, they are, let's say, we have, uh, they are powered by low pressure and they are contrasted by high pressure. Because, of course, you have to consider this, for instance, H2, 2H and the different stoichiometric value here and here tells you about the role of pressure. So the higher pressure, pressure is at this exponent uh, in front of concentration of the products. And then it's, in this case, you have that 
the, the, the equilibrium constant is reduced when pressure is higher, and it means that the product concentration is reduced in this expression when the uh, pressure is increased. So this is, you see from this, that, pres that pressure do affect the final composition, and especially is something that uh, works against dissociation, and so in general against this endothermic reaction that occur in our uh, in our engine. So what what more we have to say here? Is an interesting thing is that these are and this is important, what we are looking here are values, mass-specific values. Because when we write the, the velocity, you have to consider mass-specific entropies. It's from the mass-specific balance that we have this relation between the entropy and the exospin. Uh, of course, in terms of molar values, things are a little bit different. And you can find, uh, well, you have to understand here that, as I mentioned before, to have this peak here, for instance, means that, in some sense, this Y of uh, water vapor is maximizing in this region. But this is not necessarily the point where the molar fraction of water vapor maximizes. Because of the reaction, you see that maximum amount, molar amount of H2O occurs as stoichiometric conditions. But of course, this is not the case for the mass specific. So the mass fraction of the water vapor. Now I'll show then some uh, some more example, but let's see. Here, let's discuss with some more information. We have seen that, for instance, for 100 bar of chamber pressure, we have this peak at about 4. We have 8 here. We have delta H at 0. But we, we can also see on the same plot on the same, let's say, abscissa, the value of temperature. <clears throat> and you see the temperature maximize at uh, at stoichiometric conditions, whereas we can see, of course, that this delta HR0 is also connected to the molar mass. Which is changing in this way, well, of course, that the more hydrogen we have, the lighter will be the average molar mass, and this is, can be easily expected. So I try to show you something here.
I don't know if you can see something. Uh, well, what what I try to, I think you don't see. <laughs> but, however, what I would like to show here, these are uh, numbers obtained by software, which is CEA, is chemical equilibrium with application of NASA, and uh, allow you to compute the, the equilibrium composition in different conditions. So here, for example, I have fixed 100 bar, all cases, but with different OF, you see, from eight, which is stoichiometric, then decreasing to seven, six, five, four, three. And you see here we have the temperature and uh, the uh, the mass fraction. So where you see this star here, this is very high pressure. So we have this first column is relevant to, let's say more or less pressure, almost infinite, very high. And uh, the second column is for 100 bar. So you see the temperature in the first case, you recall that we have computed uh, 4,900 more or less as the value if only, if a stoichiometric condition, we have only H2O's product. And in fact, we have here, this is 4,838. We are there. This is not exactly stoichiometric because it's eight and it should be 7.9. <laughs> And uh, also it's not infinite, but it's very high. And in fact, you see that here we have 96% of H2O and uh, something of the other species. If we pass to 100 bar, you see the difference. We have just 0.78 as the mass fraction of water vapor. Whereas you have, for instance, here, this value, 11% of OH, 1.6% of O, and one point, uh, I know, the other, and then you have something about the O2 and H2. So the fact that we have the formation of OH because of the high temperature that is now 3,700, You have, so this temperature is lower because you have also some energy spent to, for the dissociation. Then the, what happens if I move towards higher amounts of fuel, more hydrogen than the needed for stoichiometric reaction? We see that, of course, if we uh, look to the temperature that we have, for the uh, case with the infinite pressure, as we decrease, as we decrease the OF value, we pass from uh, 4,800, 45, 4,600, 4,200, 37, 33, 2,700 Kelvin. So actually, the illusion is working as it's decreasing the uh, the temperature. And uh, this is true also if you look to the um, temperature in case of uh, lower pressure. You see again the temperature is, de is decreasing 3700, 3600, 3400, 31, 27 is decreasing, but let's say it starts from a lower value. The interesting thing is that the mass fraction of H2O is increasing because as you decrease the temperature, as you have a lower temperature and you further decrease, you have less dissociation. And so the, 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 
overall you see that here we pass from this OH was 11%, 9.7%, 6.9%, and I don't know why I have this. No. <laughs> And uh, yes, here it becomes 3.6%, 1.2% up to vanish. And uh, so Recall that the most amount here we have 13.4 as the value of uh, the entropy of formation in megawatt per kilogram. Uh, uh, and so megajoule per kilogram. And so you see here that if I multiply 0.78 by 13.4, it's 9.94. Here, 0.83 is the uh, amount of water becomes 10.74, 11.45 because we raised it to 0.87. You see that the amount, the relative amount in terms of mass fraction of H2O is increasing while the uh, amount of OH is decreasing. And this uh, yield here, the maximum value, which is 11.88, and then becomes 11.86 and so on, you don't see because I have this. Okay, you see it now, this value here. So you see that here the maximum will be between 5 and 4. And this is the maximum we, we have to, to look at, and uh, which is directly connected with the value of uh, mass fraction of H2O. So let's go further. Mm -hmm. So here are some images. Uh, that we can uh, discuss together. And you see here the body frame temperature that is evaluated with, in this case, where you see the constant value, it's, sorry, this red line is our 4900 uh, Kelvin, more or less, which is what you obtain if we consider only H2O as the product. We are at stoichiometric conditions. But you see how this temperature, the body frame temperature changes for changing pressure. This is an example just to understand the phenomenon. I'm showing you here base of pressure that goes from 1 to 10 to 12 bar. That, of course, is meaningless. But it's just to understand. And you see also how the molar mass or molecular weight, the green line, is changing. It will be 18 if you have just uh, water vapor, but it decreases if we move, if we split in some way our H2O in some lighter species like H, O, H, O. And uh, this is the, the plot of adiabatic flame temperature as function of OF. It fixed more or less always at stoichiometric condition. But you see, this was, these are the values that you have seen in the former plot. And you see the maximum here is always the same. And this is lower in case of 100 bar pressure. Hmm. 
So this is the uh, species mass fraction obtained at 100 bar, considering just H2O as the, the product. And of course, here we have to consider some H2 or some O2 because of dilution when we move towards different values of OF. But you see that the different behavior when we consider also the other species. So you see that here we have this OH followed the temperature more or less. And the same is also true for the oxygen or hydrogen uh, atoms that, however, are displaced more the peak is on the right or on the left because, of course, of the relative amount, greater amount of oxygen or of hydrogen. Um, so we go and see also this. This is quite interesting because you see the different behavior of the more fraction compared to the um, mass fraction. You see that more fraction of H2O is peaking at uh, stoichiometric conditions, whereas the mass fraction has its peak at a lower uh, OF. So, of course, you, this is can be seen. Uh, there is a way. Yes, fantastic. Uh, should be that uh, if we recall Y is M over M, that means is N, right? So it's Xi, Mi over M. So if we consider our Y, H2O, will be equal to the X of H2O, 18 over M. And you see why we have this peak here, because you have to consider also the value of the molar mass of the products that will be lower on this part. There will be something increasing this way. This is M. I hope this is clear. I see some of the just three people I see here, there is some perplexities, but <laughs> I hope, so if you have that X here, our Y is just on the right plot, we have X and Y will be X divided by M. So if M is changing, we can understand in this way, we can understand that the peak will move left. No, let's go back to the ranting. So what happens is if I increase pressure, you see here are different values of OF. What will be what we have seen in the table, we see here in a plot. And we see that we have uh, this decrease of, uh, of endothermic species and an increase of H2O as we increase pressure from 1 to 100 bar. And uh, you see this on the right, you see the mole fraction, and on the left, you see the mass fractions. So again, you can, uh, you can see that we have that. Um, the molar fraction of H2O is uh, something that we can easily recall is correctly uh, behaving with maximum stoichiometric condition. That is what we can expect. But the mass fraction moves left because of this role of the molar mass. So 
So I think we have a little break now. Uh, let's resume at uh, 15. We are late because the, the former class is later. So we will resume in uh, at uh, 5.15, okay? Il prima è, eh, si intende, in questo caso vuol dire più e rich, no? mm -hmm. in, in generale questo accade dal lato della specie più leggera, se abbiamo due reagenti ce ne sarà uno più leggero dell'altro e questo picco si sposta verso il lato più leggero che di solito è il combustibile. Di solito è il combustibile perché gli ossidanti abbiamo visto che stanno a destra, e quindi sono tipicamente più pesanti. In generale è sempre così, in, in generale, la, diciamo così, il massimo è il in zona più ricci. Il codice 53 924. Il codice per la presenza. 5, sì.
Come? Il codice dobbiamo dire con il professore. Sì, penso che dobbiamo dire. Come avete fatto per presenza? Non avete mai messo da nessuno? No, perché una volta c'erano i quattro professori Sì, allora io cerco di, di... Cioè per me è anche un messaggio di... di di serietà, no? cioè, ci sono state indicate, date delle indicazioni, cerco di seguirle, probabilmente non tutti lo fanno, è la stessa cosa di smanettare sui computer e fare, diciamo, non lasciarli come sono stati trovati a inizio giornata, però insomma ognuno fa quello che crede. Non capisco perché quella punta correttamente, ma... No, perché si è girata correttamente. Allora l'immagine è ferma sul... So we can uh, continue, and here we can see the the value of the body frame temperature as a function of OF at different pressure. This is only H2O as the product, and this is a one bar. And then you see that if I increase pressure, we try to, we go more and more close to that line. So that you understand the role of pressure in, let's say, counteracting, uh, stopping the, 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 the dissociation reaction. And uh, so in this way, blocking all the endothermic, uh, let's say, reaction that extract work, extract uh, energy from the exothermic one. Then what we have here. Yeah, this is something, uh, of course, there is a role that we have not seen uh, much so far. Of course, there is the difference between the enthalpy of formation of products and reactants, or better, reactants and products. So, of course, what we have seen so far is that we start from the standard conditions of reactants. But you can imagine that they are not a standard condition. And in this case, there is some shift related to the starting value of the, uh, of the reactants. If you start from low temperature, in this case, hydrogen and oxygen, of course, you will have overall adiabatic temperature, which is lower. The heat release is more or less the same, but you start from a lower temperature. And uh, so here also to answer what uh, you were asking, we can see another system of uh, reactants, methane and oxygen. And uh, here the stoichiometric condition is four. We have seen in the balancing the equation that stoichiometric condition should be four with the only product 
which are H2O and CO2. And this is what corresponds to the dashed line that peaks at this maximum temperature over 5,000 Kelvin. So what you see here is that depending on the number of species you consider in the reaction, you can have more or less correct approximation of the final value of adiabatic temperature. But the number of species is not too high for this evaluation. Of course, if you have CH4 and O2, you have more species than in the case of H2 and O2. You have to play with C, H, and O rather than only with uh, H and O. So you expect more species. And in fact, you, you need in this case nine species to have a good approximation of the adiabatic frame temperature as a function of OF, which is something more, I think, that before even five species was, six species was enough. But you see that considering nine species or 124 species, so because we see at age, we can do a lot of possible species. You have no changes. And uh, here is the what you see, the fifth species is one important one. If you have, when you have the formation of CO2, an important role is played also by the presence of CO, the uh, carbon monoxide that in equilibrium condition will appear. And you see here that uh, an important change, an important amount of this species occur, especially when there is more uh, carbon available. And uh, so this, the difference between these two is just that the fact that the product are not only H2O and CO2, but H2O, CO2, and CO. So the maximum of CO2 is split between the role of CO and the role of CO2 on the right hand side uh, plot where we have this species mass fraction behavior. And then if you go, you, you have to consider also here to have a better approximation how to introduce these quantities like H, O, O, H that are the most endothermic. Uh, actually, uh, CO is still uh, exothermic, if I'm not wrong, but we'll check it later. But of course, what is uh, should be avoided is at least in a theory to, to, uh, to have the maximum output of energy is the presence of OH, which absorbs a lot of energy and O here. And you see that exactly like in the case of uh, hydrogen oxygen, we have a correspondent of the stoichiometric condition where we have the maximum temperature, we have the maximum amount of dissociated species. So I call them uh, with different names. The correct one should be endothermic species because dissociation actually should apply to H2 that gives to H uh, or O2 that gives to, to O. OH, well, we can consider dissociation of H2O in OH and H, but it, of course, it's still something lighter. So it's a split heavier molecule, but in general, we can call it, let, let's call it as an endothermic species. Uh, yes, you see, this is again the comparison of more fractions and mass fractions. Of course, also here, if you recall the table, the H2O among all the species is the most exothermic one. So the peak of H2O is important, uh, of H2O mass fraction. And you see that here is again in the fuel rich region and uh, it's more evident uh, that is on this side, then the more fraction, but here you have to consider that CH4 is not H2. CH4, a smaller mass of 
16, which is not so different of the molar mass of water, and so has not a huge effect on the. Uh, we cannot see a huge difference between mole and mass fractions in this case. So what's this is just uh, the effect of pressure, and you see the effect of pressure on H2O and CO2, especially. And this is important. You see that for CO, the dependence is uh, less evident, whereas you see that for CO2 and H2O, we have an increase of the amount by increasing pressure. And you see, again, the reduction of OH and O with increasing pressure. And we can see the same plot that I've seen before. And this is the four species. That means uh, H2O2, uh, CO2, and H2O. And only the last two as products of reaction. So this is the dashed line in red. And uh, this is the result for the body temperature in blue line at different pressures. And we see the same. And as we increase pressure, we close this ideal value. But we have to go up a lot with pressure. So this is something that will never happen. So we have to expect that we have to deal with this incomplete reaction, with this equilibrium condition in all practical cases. Uh, yes, you see here uh, something slightly different. This is again H2O2 of what we have seen before. And actually here what is emphasized is the role of temperature over the molar mass, which is not, is related to, but is not our delta H available, our heat of reaction, because there is also gamma. So if you would like to, to, to adjust your relation. And you see that here, the maximum of T over M, of course, at even lower value, of OF is blue line. The blue line shows that the maximum of TC over M, here is written TF, but with our uh, names, this is TC, and uh, occurs here, whereas you, you, you have seen before that maximum of uh, delta H should be at about four. But again, you see the temperature, you have already seen, and the molar mass with the green line. Uh, this is for methane oxygen, the same plot. So look to the various TC over M, the blue line. Again, they peak at fewer rich conditions, whereas the temperature peaks at more or less stoichiometric conditions. And this is a more complex hydrocarbon that shows similar behavior. I'm not to consider it too much now. So this gives us an overview of this. We recall that which is our path, we are analyzing the, the chemical rockets. And so after the analysis of what is general for thermal rockets, which is the expansion in the nozzle, we are now focusing on our C star in some way. So on the heat release, on the energy that we can release with our chemical reactions. And we have now seen that possibly is not the stoichiometric condition, the best one in terms of energy release, 
because we have to take into account the occurrence of the presence of other species because of the equilibrium condition we are assuming as the reference a chamber where we have where we said that there is enough time to reach the equilibrium conditions then we have also said that uh, when we consider the evaluation of uh, the exo speed we have to consider the composition actually we should consider the composition that we have not at chamber but at the exit of the of the nozzle and so the the simple thing that we have seen so far is that we assume that okay we have this equilibrium composition and this more or less remains the same all along the expansion so this gives us a reference point uh, allow us to make consideration i think there it's important to identify for instance this mixture ratio dependence it's important to identify the occurrence of chemical reaction up to equilibrium in the chamber is an important reference, but it's not all. We will discuss now why it's close to the, 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 the final result, or at least is something uh, that has to do with it. In fact, what we have talked about before also is that we should consider, we can consider two extreme possible operating condition, let's say ideally, of the nozzle, at least from a computational point of view. We have, we can make the assumption of frozen flow or of equilibrium flow. That means that in the first case, composition remains unchanged from chamber up to the exit. And in the second case, we are considering that composition will always be at any point of the nozzle, the equilibrium composition. So you consider that the fluid particle has always enough time to reach its equilibrium conditions. So these are two possible ex extreme. And what happens is that because temperature is decreasing along the expansion process, the equilibrium condition will shift toward, for instance, for our H2O2 systems, we switch towards more and more H2O because temperature is decreasing and the equilibrium condition will make disappear the endothermic species. So this tells us that we expect that the equilibrium case will provide us with more performance than the frozen case. So we recall this I don't like this to We have our thrust chamber and uh, or nozzle. We have chamber condition and exit condition here. And uh, we have frozen expansion means that the composition at the exit is equal to the composition of the flow at chamber, whereas in the equilibrium condition, this is not the case. This equilibrium or shifting equilibrium condition. So in both cases, we can assume that the phenomenon will occur uh, adiabatically without a change of heat to its surroundings. And ideally, so with the slow change of composition in case of equilibrium, and we know change of composition in case of frozen flow. So we have already seen the something like our frozen flow which is the ideal nozzle, which is an isentropic process. It can be considered also as isentropic, the equilibrium process, because, uh, you know, we have seen 
that this is a reversible process. There is no heat exchange with surroundings, and so it is isentropic too. Well, this is the ideal uh, reference. The, the real world is different, and as we have, for instance, uh, some momentum, and we have a wall where there is zero velocity, there will be currents that tell us that there is something which is non-isentropic between the wall and the, and the core flow. It's the viscous boundary layer. Or when we have some heat flux, it's the same. We have temperature gradients, we have currents, we have something which is not uh, isentropic. And here we, we will have some to pass from one equilibrium condition to another. We have some gradient of uh, mass fractions of concentration of different species. That means that we have gradients, we have currents, we have non-isentropic flow. And this is what we have already seen when we talked about the equilibrium condition. We, we in fact, we were looking for the minimum energy that is the equilibrium one. Whereas there is in general a process that brings us towards this equilibrium condition. So we refer to this process as the non-equilibrium process that brings us from one equilibrium condition to another condition that can be or not an equilibrium condition. And uh, so it's important at this point to discuss a little bit the non-equilibrium or the, let's say, the process of chemical reactions for uh, also for this reason here we have this frozen and equilibrium approximation what is the best one what is closer to the real world and why and when so if we have an idea of how the the, the, the action process evolves within the nozzle we will better understand why we should rely on one or the other uh, assumption so the, the focal point, let's say the, the, the important point, is time at this point. Mm. It's time. Because we, we, what we said is that to reach the equilibrium condition, we need time. And uh, so at, at this point, we have to make, let's say, some comments about that. Let's consider a fluid particle which evolves through here, which evolves along. Uh, thrust chamber. Mm. What happens to this fluid particle? Will, uh, it will experience different temperatures because here temperature is higher than here at the chamber will be higher than at the exit. And we, it will experience also different speed. It will start with a low speed and then it will be accelerated. This is our goal, so we know it very well. And in particular, we see that we will have some pressure and temperature that evolves in similar way as we move forward, decreasing, and we have a velocity that on the opposite is increasing. And we consider a given point here, for instance. You see that here, typically, we have close to the chamber, high temperature, low velocity. But at this point, you have a given, but at any point, we have, for instance, this other point, we have lower temperature, higher velocities. In general, we have a given temperature and velocity at each point along our expansion. So uh, we need enough time to reach the equilibrium. So if we know, let's assume that we know how much time we need to reach the equilibrium. I have to compare the time needed to reach the equilibrium with the residence time at that temperature, at that pressure, 
of the fluid particle. So uh, we could compare. So to stay at a given temperature, we have to consider how the temperature, for instance, of the particle changes with time. And to have enough time, it means that, let's say that we have, a, let's call this A, probably it's not, uh, let's use another symbol, alpha, uh, which tell us, let's say, the change of temperature in time should be less than a quantity characterizing that reaction. Because if uh, this is greater, it means that we have not enough time to reach the uh, equilibrium conditions. So this change of temperature in time, but why the temperature should change in time for that fluid particle? It changes in time because it is not always at the same place. It is moving. And uh, as it moves, it goes towards other positions within the nozzle where temperature is different, is lower. In fact, this dt in time, of course, is changing because we have a gradient of temperature with uh, axial position and of course, we have that this position is changing in time, and this is the velocity. So you see that here we have that what has to be less than this quantity characterizing that reaction is related to the velocity and the temperature gradient in axial direction. So for a given temperature gradient in axial direction, it means that we have a condition on this velocity. And this velocity, in fact, what is, what represents? If this alpha is, is linked to the characteristic, characteristic time of the chemical reaction, this U is related to the, what we can call as the fluid dynamic characteristic time of permanence in a given position or in, in a given length. Mm. So actually, what we are saying here is that something like one over fluid dynamic time must be less than one over uh, chemical characteristic time. And this should be valid for all the reactions that take place in the in the nozzle. So if this is true, you see, if we have uh, this condition means that the fluid dynamic time is far greater than, it should be greater than the chemical time, that means that we have enough time to reach the equilibrium. So this is the condition for the equilibrium. But of course, uh, it's interesting now to make a further step to understand what is what are these times and on what are the de their dependencies on uh, the, the characteristics of the flow that we have in different places within the nodules, in the nodes. So uh, there is something that we can uh, also stress here. It is the presence of this gradient. Hmm? Because uh, this is change of temperature in time and something characterizing the reaction. This is change of position in time, but this velocity is something that we have seen in our discussion. We never talk about X, if you recall. We have that velocity related to the area in the one-dimensional approximation, and is something which is not depending on the x. That means it's independent of the scale of the engine. If you are considering this nozzle here or this nozzle here of the same shape at the same proportional distance from the at the same area ratio 
with respect to the trot area here and here. This ratio is the same, velocity is the same for given chamber conditions. And, uh, but here you see that we have the gradient of temperature with respect to X. And this changes depending on the, the size of the engine. So the discussion about equilibrium of frozen flow is also affected by the scale of the engine because the time I spent for a given velocity in a given region, of course, if this region is greater, it's, it's longer. So when you expect to find more, uh, uh, what do you expect is closer to equilibrium condition, a small engine or a big engine? The big engine, of course, there will be longer times, and so it will be closer to equilibrium conditions. So if we like now to characterize these chemical times, we should see something more about these chemical reactions. So chemical reactions uh, means that we have a, a production or this destruction of a given species as a function of time. And in particular, we have some rate of production, rate of destruction. So we have, we can identify the first quantity, which is I call this sigma i, which is a function in general of t, p, and y of the different species, j, all the species. And this sigma i is the amount or the mass of a given species that is produced per unit volume and time. So the sigma represents the mass of a given species which is produced per unit time and volume. And we like, uh, of course, this is the quantity that represents our let's say, the, 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 the fact that some reaction is occurring. Of course, when we are in equilibrium condition, in frozen condition, there is no production, no destruction of a given species in time. Or there is production and destruction at the same time, balancing zero. So if this is the overall balance, this will be zero. So, but to evaluate this, we should see what is the real uh, process of chemical reactions? We are not satisfied in saying H2 plus one half O2 gives H2O. We should consider also the intermediate, intermediate step that makes this to occur. And this is not a direct collision, let's say, of a molecule of oxygen, a molecule of hydrogen that give us a molecule of water. We have some intermediate steps. So to uh, to clarify this, let's consider now another reaction that is even simpler than H2 and O2, which is the one between H2 and F2, hydrogen and fluorine. Stoichiometric reaction is one alpha F2 plus one alpha. H2 gives HF, mm. hydrofluoric acid. So we have written this in this way, this kind of ration, this is a way we are used. Another way we are used is to write this by a double arrow to highlight the occurrence of forward and backward direction that gives an equilibrium condition. We have written this for the computation of equilibrium condition. We also say that one half F2 plus one half H2, which are the reactants, give us A F2 plus B H2. 
plus C H F. We also wrote it in this way to see this is the same as this one for the equilibrium, but we consider that these are the reactants and among the products of reaction, we have also some reactants that is so to use to evaluate the uh, composition and the properties of the equilibrium result. But and we have also seen, or for not not for this reaction, but for H2O2, that the uh, overall we have to consider also the other reactions. And here, so if we have this one and two and three, we have four, which is the case where we have also uh, further reactions for the formation in this case of F and H. And so in, in this case, we have uh, the first reaction for the formation of HF, but also the formation of F and formation of H. And if you like, if you are going to use this, if two plus three is used to have a, an equilibrium reaction here and the equilibrium composition here, so you have balance of atoms by three and uh, another uh, equation by the equilibrium condition of two. So let's say this should be together. With four, there will be uh, a fifth uh, case, which is the corresponding to number three, which is uh, the, the atomic balance for the system of reactions. Something like this. Hmm? And so four and five together can be used to, to evaluate the equilibrium condition. But the real case is not this. We the, the actual case should consider uh, you see here for, for instance one half have two, what's meaning? is a proportion of different species. It's not a process. The process you expect is that for a reaction, is that you have two molecules or two atoms, or one molecule and an atom, so two uh, particles, more or less complex, that collide. And because if we have enough, enough uh, energy in this collision, they will break their chemical bonds and rearrange them. This is the actual process. So if this is the actual process, we have to represent this mechanism that brings us to our final equilibrium condition. And if you are interested to the process, of course, we have to represent the process. So what happens in the real case for this reaction? It may happen that a molecule of fluorine collide with something else. Let's call it, this is called usually a third body. Let's call it M. And if we have that this collision is, has enough energy, it will be able to break this, uh, these molecules of F.
So you see here you have F2 molecules. You have a generic other particle. They collide. And we have, as a result, the, the same M. And we have F and F. And there will be some energy which is lost in this case. It's an endothermic reaction. So the, the overall energy, kinetic energy of this particle after collision will be less. So should I put an arrow in this direction here? Uh, of course, it will here in the reverse reaction, this M is neutral. If you are moving from right to left here, what happens is that these two collide here and can join to make the molecule of F2, but M is not playing any role. Okay, so it can still work, but you know that here the collision is between the two F and M. Is, this is just a third body that helps to write this in backward and forward direction, but doesn't play a role in the backward direction. So what is M? M is, can be F, F2, H2, H, HF. So any other molecule. And similarly, for the dissociation of the hydrogen and for the dissociation of the uh, HF, Hydrogen fluoride is another way of calling it. H plus F plus M. And the meaning is always the same. We have always molecules made of two atoms that are broken by the collision with another one, or that can they can join to form uh, the molecules starting from their atoms. And then you have also other processes, which are in this case, related to the arrangement of from one atomic molecule to another one. And for instance, you can consider HF plus F, which collide, and they uh, will form F2 plus H. which is not, you see, is not exactly like this one because we have HF on one side and F2 on the other side. So we have from biatomic to biatomic by exchange of the atoms. And this can go in both directions. And this can be done in different ways. This is the binary exchange reactions. So these are dissociations. And these are binary exchange. Reactions. And there is also something as the first reaction that we talked about. In fact, they are two, in this case, we are two molecules that can collide and bring two other two molecules, in this case of HF.
So for each of these reactions, we can write our equilibrium constant, and I will stop with, uh, with this just to recall that you can write here in general for any reaction for the equilibrium condition. So you write the reaction in this way this time is uh, is the one with all positive news. It's not the case that we have seen with the uh, algebraic value positive for products and negative for reactants. Now, in, in here is uh, good to make a distinction between reactants and products, or let's say of from between one side and another side of the reaction. And here we have that. Uh, of course, pi will be xi new ijp minus new ijr. We can write this in this way. So, of course, uh, you see here what is strange uh, respect to what we have seen before is this subscript J. And the subscript J occurs because we are now looking to a complex system, to a mechanism of reactions, and each J is a different reaction. So J is equal to one, in this expression is, for instance, this one. So we have uh, A1, for instance, is F2, and here we have new 1, 1, this one, and so on. So uh, if uh, A1 is our F2, there will be here, there will be new 1, 1 is equal to 1, new 1, 2 will be equal to 0 because we have no F2. And uh, also among the reactants, we will never find again F2. We have just it just here and here and here. So you'll find this new one will be only different from 0 as new 1, 1, R. And new, this is the fourth one, 1, 4, P is equal to 1, and new 1, 6, P is also equal to 1. So this is the, the, the way of collecting all these reactions in this single expression that will also tell us the equilibrium condition, of course, considering the equilibrium constant that will be for each of these reactions. So this is why I have K, P, J. For each reaction, there is different equilibrium constant, and there is different role of pressure that will be related to the delta nu that we have on the single reaction. And so it's delta nu j for this reason in that expression. And, uh, and here we have to consider the different species participating to that reaction, of course. So this is uh, all for today. In the next lecture, we will continue to talk about the non-equilibrium condition, and we would like to comment about the role of temperature and of pressure that we have in defining our characteristic time of reaction, so the reaction rates. Professor, is it possible? Prego. Uh, 
per, per la file che ha mostrato con i vari uh, plot, ce lo renderà disponibile oppure no? Sì, sì, lo, uh, oggi lo troverete sul, uh, sui learning. Ok, la ringrazio. Prego. Arrivederci. Arrivederci.